So the reason I picked this game is kind of similar to my rationale for having done Claymates. My sister and I, as Little Snicks, rented this game from the video store, and I remember it being kind of a mediocre platformer, but with weirdly good music. So having revisited some other oddities of that era, it's time for me to put my childhood memories to the test. So how was this odd, odd game? Well, join me, won't you, for a closer look at Smart Ball. Greetings everyone, this is the Hipster Snack, and today I'm going to talk about a game that has a rather interesting history. Smart Ball was released in Japan in 1991 and in North America in 1992, having been developed by a little-known company that you've probably never heard of called Game Freak, and published by an even more obscure company that you might know as Sony. Credited with direction, designing, and writing is a certain someone you might know by the name of Satoshi Tajiri, alongside Ken Sugimori. I swear I couldn't make this stuff up if I tried. The guys who would go on to make Pokemon, and Sony, made this weird cartoony platformer for the Super Nintendo. It sounds like a satire, but it's not. The story, from what little information is out there about this game, is that a prince, named Jerry, was set to marry the princess Emmy, but his jealous friend, brother, cousin, it's really not clear. A guy named Tom, get the joke? broke an evil wizard out of jail in order to turn Jerry into a little blob thing in order to get him out of the way. Seeing as how this game has almost no text in it, trying to find a full story out of this, I might as well just be guessing based on the pantomime. Well, to start with, the game looks good. It has this real cartoony style, definitely inspired by late 80s anime. Everything is bright and colorful, particularly Jerry himself being the shiny blue and the items he picks up ranging from bright reds and greens to the duller blacks and whites, depending on level and necessity. The enemies themselves are... interesting, to say the least. Between cartoon mice, who idly meander around and largely accomplish nothing, to fireball enemies, which can be a bit more annoying to deal with, to birds who are literally made of fire and just drop flames just to make your life that much more difficult. The enemy design is... distinct, if not a bit unfocused and random, but at least you know what you're dealing with when you come to each of them. The levels represent eight themes, spread out across the game's 16 levels, ranging from ruined cities, castles, snowy tundras, Egyptian pyramids, and more. It's actually very visually stimulating, special note being paid to the interestingly designed moon levels, which actually break the format for how levels progress for a well-deserved break in the pacing. And the music. The music in this game is absolutely mind-blowingly good. Like, way, way better than this game rightfully deserves. Like, while the title theme may not be anything to write home about, the overall sound design is actually really incredible. Tracks like the one used for the moon levels, the tundra, and the castle are actually prone to getting stuck in my head. In fact, the castle theme track getting stuck in my head randomly one afternoon is what reminded me that I had even played this game, even though it's basically been 30 years now. That is a terrifyingly high quality of music work put into a game where the same A for effort showing was not made by any of the other teams. That aside, the sound effects are charming, in a word. Mostly squeaks and pops and the like, making even big boss fights softer, fluffier, and a bit less frustrating. Overall, a very good audio experience. And I checked, the full OST is on YouTube. Go listen to it, it's pretty solid stuff. The gameplay is where I have to bring up the fact that the game is mediocre and unpolished, because it absolutely is. While it's less obvious early on, where it seems a lot of care and decision making was made to help teach the player everything they need to know in order to progress, it soon catches up. Let's do things in order. The game has no options menu and no means to continue from the title screen. You press start and you're just plunked into world 1A, like it or not. Now, there does exist a cheat code that serves as a level selector, but nothing in-game will ever tell you that. So unless you had a magazine subscription or just knew someone who already knew, there was no knowing that back in the 90s. So you always start from the first stage and all seems well. It's one of those platformers where merely leaping on the enemies isn't how you actually defeat them. Rather, Jerry can squash and stretch like a cartoon character, but using up and down in order to shift his little blobby body to hit nearby enemies. Now, if you're looking at this and going, but this is rather impractical for dealing with enemies on the ground unless your timing is really good, since it only counts as an attack during the animation and not while simply holding it, all I can say is, well, yeah. 
The mice, for instance, can be dealt with by standing atop them and squishing down, which works just fine. Or you can run past them. It's really an immediate need to kill enemies rather than avoid them until later levels, and by then you'll figure out some other mechanical nuance that's good to know. For instance, there are flowers dotting every stage. Striking one will open it up and it will give you an item, oftentimes an additional heart container, which will run you the duration of the stage that you're in, giving you a max health of up to four, even if you pick up more than one in a single stage because, well, nuts to you. Afterward, if reopened, the flower will often give you red balls, which Jerry can shoot out at enemies as a projectile attack. In most instances, you can even grind these out and you get more than enough time to clear each stage, so it's not like this is ever a bad idea. Oh yeah, fun fact. I noticed this while doing a test run before scripting. You can shoot any of the colored orbs Jerry can collect straight up into the air and then catch them again afterward, and you'll be rewarded the same point amount for doing this as you do for collecting them in the first place. Some later levels get smart with this design, as some levels utilize platforms made up of flowers, thus necessitating you to run to the other side to avoid falling. But it's one of the rare moments where I find myself praising the level design. Let me get back to that because Jerry can hold more than just red balls. At max health, said balls also explode on impact, which doesn't appear to do any more damage than normal, but it's a bigger shot, I guess, so there's that. But there's also the reusable iron ball, which can be picked up and fired a limitless number of times at the expense of it slowing Jerry down and limiting his jump height while he carries it. The reverse of which being the white jump ball, which allows Jerry to, you guessed it, jump higher than normal. And lastly is the green seed item, which when fired, will grow a beanstalk wherever it lands, and I'll be honest, there's very few instances in the game where you'll actually need this, and that's because Jerry has one very important trick up his no sleeves. That is, if you're holding the dash button, you can just scale walls and ceilings. This is actually an essential skill to master, just based on the overall level design being what it is. However, there are limits. While you can move from wall to ceiling in a 90 degree turn, you cannot perform a similar turn in order to go from a ceiling to a wall in order to scale higher. Of all abilities to not give the player, that's where they draw the line apparently. Things like this make me wonder if mechanics like the ability to move between corners of blocks, a mechanic used heavily in the later game levels in particular, was either a bug or a feature found in the game's code. Because here's where it all comes unglued. About halfway in, the entire game design becomes slapdash and sloppy. Like they decided, hey, we only have time and resources for eight worlds broken up into two phases each. Hurry up and escalate the difficulty, and you end up with aggressively poor design. The desert stage feels like filler and was designed to just be annoying rather than meaningfully challenging, as there are potential endless loops and annoying platforming, and this only gets worse as you move into tube puzzles, this game's version of teleport mazes, as it just felt like they had no ideas and no time left to finish it in any satisfying way. So the latter half of the game is just peppered with enemies and spikes on every surface, and the bosses are still the same brain-dead encounters you can kill by shooting a few red balls at them and you'll just win. So you beat the last boss and Jerry turns back to a human, and you save the princess, I guess? And they recolor Jerry's human sprite for Tom, I guess? I just read all that off the Wikipedia page anyway, so who cares, game's over now. Oh, also? I'm not going to show it for reasons I'm about to explain, but I can't recommend that you watch the credit scroll if you suffer epilepsy. It just flashes wild random colors and it's really unpleasant to look at when only half a dozen people are named in said credits anyway. And there's nothing after the end anyway, as it's the type of game that is lock on the screen and then you'll need to shut the console off manually at that point. So what went wrong exactly? Well, if you'll allow the simile, this is sort of like a group project between three people, where one person brings an A-plus effort, one person brings a B, and one person decides not to go to school that day and leave it to the others to carry the group. The music and sound is out of this world, the graphics are pretty darn good, but the level design, the key element to the game's feel, only has a few good ideas before it all just falls apart. And for a game that only lasts maybe three hours tops, the enjoyable parts are going to be short-lived indeed. It's just, as said, mediocre and unpolished, and it's clear to me now why no one else remembers this game 30 years later. It really didn't deserve to be remembered. This has been the Smart Snack. If you liked today's episode, be sure to tap the like button so I know. Did you know about this game before now? Leave a comment telling me so. I'd be curious to see if it was just me. And for more like this each week, you can tap the subscribe and bell icon so you'll never miss a one. 
And you can join me here every week from our obscure reviews, the Tomodachi Bros podcast's new home on YouTube, and all the more right here. And I will see you there.